Okay, so as I said, um, I am going to do um, a Facebook Live about Teacher Tom's recent post uh, called Birds of a Feather. So if you have not read it, that's perfectly fine because how I'm actually, part, a big part of how I'm responding to it is I'm actually going to be reading it to you. Um, so, so that's possibly gonna seem a little weird for you, almost like I'm reading a story, but I'm not. I'm reading, um, so his name is Tom Hobson. And before I start reading it, I'll just tell you a little bit about what I know about him. I feel like everybody knows him. I feel like the whole globe knows Tom Hobson. So many years ago, he began to write his blog, and he religiously writes in it every single day. And um, he, he worked at uh, a cooperative program in Seattle. I, I'm sure Tom can come on later on and comment and tell me what I get wrong. <laughs> um, I'm going to get the name of his program wrong, and that is so wrong of me. I want to say Woodland Cooperative or Woodlawn. I'm getting it wrong, I'm sure. Hi, Shirley. It's nice to see you across the miles. I hope you're safe. Um, so I read his blog for years and years and years. And 95% of the time, I loved every single word he wrote. And you know, it's important to not agree with every single thing. It's important. Uh, because we're all individual thinkers and we can learn from each other. But I found it really interesting. And then one year when ECDA in Prince Edward Island brought him to their fall conference, I went over and I was torn because I had never heard Mark Battle from Alberta speak and I was dying to hear him speak. I heard that he's very, very dynamic and that he um, he's very dynamic and uh, everybody apparently every year flock to hear him speak and spend the day with him, Mark Battle. But I knew I wanted to spend uh, my day at that conference with Teacher Tom. And so again, as I said, it was my very first time, um, my first time hearing Tom speak. And so now I'm trying to find, I see his today's post. There we are, okay. So then he was at breakfast before we spent the day, before I spent the day all day in his session. And I'm gonna be completely honest. I was totally a fangirl, because uh, he was at the very next table. And I was at, at a table with someone from our team. I was like, that's Teacher Tom. That's Teacher Tom, that's Teacher Tom. And so then I went and it was a really small group with him. And we were together for, as I said, all morning, lunch break, all afternoon. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And he was really a different presenter. He had no notes. He had no PowerPoint behind him. And it was different. Uh, I really had to, because I'm a visual learner, I'm so dependent upon the PowerPoint slides, I really had to focus and listen to his voice. And I enjoyed every minute of it. I did, I'll be honest. Um, since then, we both presented at a conference in Maryland uh, called the Play Empowers Conference. And my favorite moment from, uh, oh my God, I have so many favorite moments from that conference. So many favorite moments. But one of my favorite moments relative to Tom is that we had uh, just toured uh, Keisha Reed's preschool in Poolsville, Maryland. And we were sitting side by side in Adirondack chairs afterwards, just chit-chatting. I believe we both had Converse sneakers on with our feet just slung out, relaxing, because it had been a very busy conference. And we were talking about life and about programs and about the playground, really talking about the playground. And then I saw him again uh, when I went to Ithaca, New York for a uh, conference. Sorry that the camera keeps jiggling. I had said that I'm home quarantining for COVID 
and I have three animals, so they bumped the table. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. So he wrote it yesterday, and it's called Birds of a Feather Will Flock Together. I learned the song when Sammy put the paper on the wall from Beth Boz, Michael Lehman, and Tom Hunter. So I have that song. I'm just gonna play it for you in the background. But I thought that would be distracting. You can find the version, their version of it, with any search engine. But the lyrics that I've memorized, so again, remember that I'm reading Teacher Tom here. When Sammy put the paper on the wall, he put the parlor paper in the hall. He papered up the stairs. He papered all the chairs. He even put a border on Grandma's shawl. When Sammy put the paper on the wall, he poured a lot, a pot of paste upon us all. I'm hearing the song in my head. Now we're all stuck together like birds of a feather since Sammy put the paper on the wall. The most important part of the song is when we all become stuck together. So he's talking about how he would sing the song at his program in Seattle. I kneel in the middle of the floor, then the children gather around, crowding in everyone's arms around the backs of others. And then we stay that way for a long moment, feeling one another's warmth, the air becoming hot and moist from our mingled breaths. In that moment, as we anticipate the cue to release our individual selves once again. We are one, one body, one voice, one focus, and one immune system. We are better and stronger because we have come together, birds of a feather. Sometimes kids opt out of the big group hug, but rarely. Even the most standoffish find themselves drawn to be apart. Sometimes even parents joined in, dropping to their knees, forming a ring of arms around us, our beaming faces flushed, sharing air, breathing together, all of us, birds of a feather. Every professional who works with young children knows that plans for preschool children to return to school with enforced social distancing is impossible. We all know it. They show us pictures of kids in South Korea or Denmark spaced perfectly. It's a lie. Show me a video of their day. There is no way those preschoolers are maintaining anything close to the mandated distance, at least not without the imposition of cruel measures. It sickens me to think of teachers inventing new misanthropic lyrics to our joyful song that discourage coming together. Instead of, we all come together, he has in brackets, we all stay apart like halves of a broken heart. It crushes my soul to think of children being brainwashed to avoid real contact with their friends, to keep their hands to themselves, to build alone, to paint alone, to dig alone, to play alone, all to the tune of adults admonishing them that their playmates, their loved ones, are too toxic to touch. Too many of our children are already growing up with the knowledge that others get to tell them what to do with their bodies and their minds. Already we teach them to accept that adults get to tell them where to go, how to behave, and even what they must think about while they are there. And now there are those who are seriously contemplating taking away literally 
the air that our children must breathe because whether or not the adults get it, the kids do. We are birds of a feather and we're stuck together. Children know this even if we adults have forgotten. The bare bones truth of the story we are living right now is that the children do not have to return to their schools, but the adults must return to work. Either we're planning to send the children back so the parents can return to work, or we're going to keep the children socially isolated at home with their parents, pretending that Zoom is good enough. As a preschool teacher, I have lived most of my adult life in the petri dish of preschool. I've inhaled every contagion that has come our way, and so have the children. All of us stuck together, embracing, breathing the same air in and out. Birds of a feather stuck together. Of course, we wash our hands. We try to sneeze into our elbows and sanitize all the surfaces. Of course, we stay home when we are under the weather, but it's all done with the realist understanding that it is mostly kabuki. I'm not advocating, so again, this is Teacher Tom, I'm reading his, his post. I'm not advocating for any sort of public policy here. I'm just pointing out that social distancing in preschool is impossible. Birds of a feather will flock together. And the only thing that can keep them apart is cages. <clears throat> so I read that this morning. I didn't read it yesterday. I read it this morning. I also this morning had within moments of it read a post um, about having circle through or having any kind of early childhood through Zoom or virtual kinds of early childhood. And I also read uh, a list that has been sent out in Quebec because <clears throat> the elementary children are going back to school on May the 19th. And I believe it's May the 19th. <clears throat> uh, and that list I'd love to read to you as well. Because it is incredibly, incredibly, overwhelmingly takes your breath away. To read it and try to imagine elementary school children going to school and having those restrictions that are in that list and what kind of experience those children will be having and what role will the educators be playing. So I will read that to you separately. So with regards to Teacher Tom's blog post, I know that, I know that daycares have to open. Um, I also should just say, just in case other people share my video, some people don't like the word daycare. Um, early learning center, early childhood center, day school, school, play school, whatever you call yourself. We're all doing the same thing. We're doing, we're hopefully giving children what they need and what they, what they, uh, getting them opportunities to play and develop relationships, caring relationships with others as they grow and honoring their individuality. <clears throat> so I know that they have to open because the economy needs to get going and families need places to put their children. But as governments are developing the lists of the restrictions and the rules that have to be in place for these programs to exist and operate, it really is so important and so necessary to really think long and hard about 
how the children will react in the environment. So um, with Corey's live feeds, because she has been, uh, her program, Hope Day School in Dallas, Texas, has continued to be in operation through the whole pandemic with uh, much smaller groups of children. She has shared how uh, a couple weeks ago, it, they became mandated to have children two and above wearing masks. Um, she has shared all the safety protocols and she has talked about how the kids are still playing and they're playing and they're being resilient and they're being resourceful. And I think that is important. That is important. Um, I know for myself, uh, a couple weeks ago, we started doing Zoom gatherings, a different age group each day, 20 minutes or so. And maybe by the third preschool one, I saw some preschoolers playing with each other through the screen. So you could see all the kids on the screen. And there's some articles that talk about what that does to the brain. Not necessarily positive things, but we really want to maintain and build and keep the connection between the, the children and their friends and the teachers. So that's why we did it. And so uh, as a teacher was reading a story and lots of the kids on the screen were listening to the story, you could see that they were attending. There were two kids up in the corner and they were playing with each other. And there was no real way to tell that they were like specifically looking at each other because they weren't together in front of me at a circle. So I wasn't reading the book. I was just an attendee at the circle but I was watching them and I could see them playing with each other. And so I started doing the same things they were doing because it was obvious that they had Zoom in gallery view. And they laughed and they started to play with me as well. And it was both exciting and really, really, really sad. because it's exciting that they're that resilient and they're that resourceful. And when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, obviously at their own homes, they're getting enough safety and comfort and acceptance and sense of belonging that they're comfortable in a bizarre situation interacting with their friends on a screen that they can play. And as well, I'm going to say that they also, also got some of that from our program because they felt comfortable enough while that teacher was reading to interact solely with each other. And in some of the circles that we do through Zoom, a couple of kids are like singing the song and dancing to it or listening to the story. And some kids are just roaming their house or rolling on the floor or laying down or going to get a snack. And again, the same thing. They feel comfortable enough. They know that we accept them for who they are and they don't have to be at circle when we're at the program. They can come and they can go. But Teacher Tom's blog post just, it's so powerful. It's so, so, so powerful because what we offer when we are in regular operations is very physical and emotional. We hug children, we play games together, we sing, like he talks about that song, the Bev Boz song, and how they kneel on the floor and they hug each other and they hold each other tight. And even though some of the kids aren't necessarily super comfortable with that, they're drawn in because they wanna be a part of something bigger than just themselves. Because it's a community and it's the same thing as when we go out, like if I go somewhere to a store and I'm in a lineup or I'm having a lineup six feet apart and I'm just thinking to myself, what is, what is this? The human condition is gregarious. We are gregarious as, as a species and this is bizarre. And so we're going to try to put young children who are just formulating their understanding of how people interact with each other and what are social norms? 
and they're just, they don't even understand personal space yet. We've just been saying things to them as they're playing and growing and developing. Uh, you know, if one goes to touch someone else's work, that's my work. That's not okay, that's my work. And so they don't understand personal space. They don't respect each other's work yet. And so instead we're going to be saying things like, like that is your space. And we're going to be gesturing huge spaces. That is your space. And saying to another child, you can't go there. That is his space. You know, what What ultimately are the ramifications? So I do love that Corey says, oh, I'm so sorry for the noise. I don't even know if you can hear me. I have the balcony door open just a smidge. I probably should shut it. Can you hear me? Those of you watching, can you actually, can you comment and say if you can hear me okay, even though my balcony door is partly open? Um, so I love that Corey says that children are playing with, they have learned how to wear masks. They are keeping the masks on. They, they have learned how to wash their hands for 20 seconds and they know and they say to each other, I, I'm being safe, are you being safe? And they're still having real moments of play. I guess Teacher Tom's blog post says to me, at what cost? So Prince Edward Island shared uh, a numerous page document as to what needs to happen in their programs with regards to restrictions. And I feel like Nova Scotia's list is coming very soon. And I know we're all researching where we're buying the masks and trying to figure all the criteria out for the group sizes, etc. And I know that we will, at Kids Are Kids, open and offer programs during this pandemic. But I really listened to every word Tom said and it really resonated. And I really believe when he says that it's cruel because to say to children who don't understand space, space is a completely abstract con concept. It's just like when a parent comes in all excited and says to you, she knows the ABCs, she knows the ABCs. And the child doesn't know the ABCs. They know the song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They know that. They don't know the concept that these individual written blobs and shapes and squiggles represent letters and letters together represent words and those words represent items or actions. So children do not, there's no child in daycare or preschool ever that know their ABCs. They do get to a point where they know that these letters on my locker say me those letters, I've seen them so many times together, they say me, that's my name. But space is also, time is abstract, they don't understand time. If you say to them, it's one o'clock, they don't know what one o'clock is, unless you've said it every single solitary day, over and over and over again, and they've heard it so much that the, 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 the intonation and the one o'clock means we're on our beds. But they don't necessarily know that it is the 13th hour of a 24 hour period. And space, it's the same thing, space. Every kid has a, innately when they're born, they have no sense of space. This is why they crawl all over you and in the baby room. You see them crawling, not just on the floor or on the little the little, the little baby bump kinds of things. But you also see them when the teachers are on the floor, they crawl on the teachers. But you see that in the toddler rooms too and you see that in the preschool rooms. And in the preschool rooms, they're starting to develop a sense of space. So sometimes it's almost like a rough housing dog pile kind of experience. And you really just need to stand back and make sure that they're not hurting each other. 
but space is an abstract concept. And so after all of this time, just trying to give them just a little bit, a semblance of an understanding of space by saying that's his work. And they still don't get it. They slowly, by the time they're getting ready to go to big school, understand that that's his work. But how can we reopen and say that's his space and with our arms gesture a massive space and say that's his space? I can pick toddlers. Absolutely, the toddlers and infants. You can't possibly say to the toddlers and infants, that's his space. But the preschoolers are going to, who've been with us probably five years because they were in the infant room and the toddler room, and now they're in our preschool room, and they'll just look at us in shock and confusion as we say, that's his space. Or if we're being gender respectful, we'll be saying, that's their space. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's their space. Right now, that's their space. When they are done in that space, after I clean everything in that space, then you may enter that space. So Melanie, uh, I know Melanie very well. She's in Alberta. Um, uh, in another time and dimension, Melanie, uh, is, is my niece and my children's cousin and I haven't talked to her in forever and so she's saying that daycares are opening on the 14th but schools are closed until September but daycares are opening on the 14th because daycares are needed for economy daycares are needed for economy just now as we're starting to see articles about about Kawasaki disease taking place, the symptoms of Kawasaki disease, whether, if, is it exactly Kawasaki disease or is it so much like Kawasaki disease that children that have had COVID are a couple of weeks, you don't even know they've had COVID until they are tested as they suffer through. Uh, now I realize that the, the statistical percentages are lower uh, but we're seeing this now. There's research coming through now that a lot of children are developing, I say a lot, and I've just said that it's statistically a smaller number, but it, it's Kawasaki disease. It's either officially Kawasaki or it's very similar. And my youngest child had Kawasaki disease and it's scary. It's very scary. Their blood pressure is through the roof. They have staggeringly, staggeringly high high, high, high fevers for days on end. Um, their eyes, the whites of their eyes are blood red. Their skin peels, their skin actually peels, the rashes, the achiness they experience. And then there's gastrointestinal implications coming along relative to children and COVID. And then, um, then there's some research that's coming along that's saying, that children aren't necessarily the spreaders or the petri dishes of this particular virus that they are of, of other viruses. But none of this research is really things that we can, we can look at and examine and say is 100% or set in stone because scientifically, this whole virus hasn't existed long enough that that the research would be meet all of the requirements to be dare i say it because i'm going to offend a bunch of researchers but the credibility of the studies because they're just starting to study it and there hasn't been enough of a length of time to study it fully so we're going to open daycares up because the economy needs to get going because people have to get back to work and so we're gonna have children in bizarre situations. Some families don't put children in early childhood programs because they feel they're a little bit too institutionalized. And so they want their children to ensure that they have a sense of belonging. And so those of us that know about what it takes to have a quality early childhood program, 
we ensure that there is a sense of belonging and a sense of home and comfort and acceptance and security. And it's going to be like on top of having to follow all of this, the restrictions about cleaning and sanitizing. And we have to, and we have to do health checks and the parents can't enter the building and teachers cannot leave their classrooms to go to other rooms and materials have to be in that room for that day. So whatever they're going to need that day will have to be in that room. All of those things that we will have to do. How are we gonna make sure that all of those things are happening and we're still giving the children a sense of belonging and a sense of comfort and home and security? So if you did a really good job as a program beforehand and those kids are coming back to you and they already have a well-established rapport and relationship with you, even though you'll be wearing a mask, they can see your eyes. And so you will work on the relationship while you're doing all the other stuff. But Teacher Tom is right. Birds of a feather do flock together and children have no understanding of social distancing. And it's really wrong of us as adults to ask children to socially distance. It's wrong. It's wrong to ask adults to socially distance because we know, I can ask you right now, how are you feeling? Are you missing hugging someone? Are you missing visiting someone? Think of someone in your family who's a gigantic pain in the, you know what? And sometimes in normal circumstances, in outside of pandemic parameters, you sort of avoid that person. But right now, I bet you'd be happy to hug them and spend time with them. So if we as adults who know what distancing means, we know what space means, we know what all of that means. If we're struggling with it, how are little children gonna grasp it? And how are we as ECEs going to mentally deal with the fact that we're trying to explain an abstract concept to a child who shouldn't have to even remotely try to understand that abstract concept. And is it right or wrong that we're trying to even explain it to them? But the economy has to start. So there you go. Those of you who know me know I can keep talking, but I'm gonna stop now. I wanna thank Tom Hobson for the post. I really, really, really enjoyed reading it, Tom. And I encourage everyone out there making decisions to open daycares on like May the 14th in Alberta or opening an elementary school in Quebec on the 19th or Prince Edward Island. So here in Nova Scotia, we don't know yet the date that we're opening. But I think whoever's making the decisions need to read that because all of these things have huge implications. Thanks guys.